You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 94, Speaking Egyptian Arabic. Hello, language lovers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. This week, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Menatala Eldori, an Egyptologist and archaeobotanist, to talk about not only her language of Egyptian Arabic, but also about foods in Egypt, past and present. In this episode, Mena tells us which ancient and living languages are important to her work. We talk about the influences from ancient Egyptian languages that we can hear in modern Egyptian Arabic today, and how certain grammatical elements from Coptic are heard in the Egyptian dialect. We talk about Arabic as it's spoken in Cairo and the Kyrene dialect, while Mena tells us about the prevalence of the Egyptian dialect and why it's so understood by Arabic speakers all over. When it comes to food, Mena tells us about how we know what ancient Egyptians ate and how Egyptologists are able to understand ancient cooking methods. We talk about changing food palettes and food choices, how Egyptian food varies all over the country, and why it's important to consider the past when we're consuming modern Egyptian cuisine. Huge thank you to Mena for this conversation and for sharing your work, culture, and language with all of us. If you enjoy episodes of Speaking Tongues, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts, and like and subscribe on YouTube so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. And if you've been a longtime listener of the show or even a recent listener, you can now support the show on buymeacoffee.com. Links to all platforms are in the show notes. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Mena. How are you today, Mena? I am doing well. Thank you for inviting me, El. I'm so excited to have this conversation. And I want to tell you, I'm going to do my best to contain my enthusiasm as much as I can, because I'm really, really, really so excited about your work and what you do. And um, I want to be mindful of your time as well. (laughs) But just know that I'm super excited to talk to you today. And um, we're going to be talking about Egyptian Arabic. I like to start each episode with the same question. And that is, what is your first language and which languages have you learned to speak? My first language is Egyptian Arabic. But I learned English from a very young age. My mother always spoke to me in English. So I sometimes consider English a first language as well, even though it's not a mother language. And I I also speak German. I get by in French. And I know just enough Italian and Spanish to pretend I talk um, in Italian or Spanish. I think those are great languages to pretend with. (laughs) Yes, they're very easy. Yeah. (laughs) So... um... Tell us what you do. I mean, I know what you do, but um, tell us who are listening. Tell us what you do and tell us a bit about your your profession. I am an Egyptologist. I work in archaeology, which is lots of fun. It's very exciting. I have um, a really fun career that I'm very lucky to be able to do. And my speciality within the study of Egyptian history is archaeobotany, the study of plant remains from archaeological sites. And through that, I've been focusing on Egyptian food history in general, what people have eaten and what they've cooked and how they've sourced um, the food products that they ate throughout history. So everyone loves to talk about food. Everyone gets excited about archaeology. And so it's just a really nice combination to be able to do the history and archaeology of food. So exciting. And I think that's great. And I'm so happy that you said that your work is exciting because I think that we're so used to the media representation of what archaeologists do. And we get a lot of, you know, Indiana Jones, obviously. um, Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider, exactly. Um, And I think it, it gets very sensationalized. So for me, it's really wonderful to hear about what you do and you know, as a real person and not, you know, not Tomb Raider necessarily. (laughs) 
it's it's a, it's a very different existence as an archaeologist from what you see in in movies. Mm-hmm. So, how does language play into um, mm-hmm. your role in the archaeolo- archaeological field? That's a tough word for me today. Um, how does <laughs> la- <laughs> how does language play a role in in archaeology and your field of work? And which languages? for for specifically what you do, um, current and ancient, um, enable you to excel in the work that you do? So when you study Egyptology, you have to learn the ancient Egyptian language. Mm -hmm. And this is what people refer to as hieroglyphs. But hieroglyphs is actually not the language. It's just the way it's written, the script, these little signs, these birds and animals and different signs. These are called hieroglyphs. And we have to learn the multiple stages of the ancient Egyptian language. Of course, the ancient Egyptians extended over 3000 years. And so the language extended with them and changed. And there were many different phases of this ancient Egyptian language. And we start with, when you start learning um, ancient Egyptian, you start with what we call Middle Egyptian, the classical form of that. And then you learn different stages of the language. And then we also learn the last stage of the language, which is Coptic. Mm. It is the ancient Egyptian language. It's the same, basically the same thing, but written in Greek letters with the addition of seven extra letters that weren't in the Greek alphabet, but they represent sounds in the ancient Egyptian language. Mm. And this is a language that is still used today by Uh, Coptic Orthodox Christians in Egypt um, used in mass, um, although it is, of course, dying out and some families still speak uh, Coptic dialects amongst one another. Again, this is dying out. So we we get to learn a lot of dead languages uh, and living ones like like Coptic, as well as because it is a European dominated field. A lot Mm. of the publications we work with are written in European languages. So we have to learn, of course, French and and German, at least to be able to read publications and to communicate our research, which is very important. I see. Do any of the ancient forms of the language and the the Coptic, do have they at all influenced the modern day Egyptian Arabic language? Absolutely, absolutely. There are so many grammatical constructions and from the ancient Egyptian, from the different phases of the ancient Egyptian language that have survived and words as well. Um, When we were learning ancient Egyptian, um, there was this grammatical construction called pu, just P-W, and it comes at the beginning of a sentence and we don't translate it into English. We were of course learning ancient Egyptian in English. Um, and it made no sense to me. Why would I have this random sound at the beginning of a sentence and it's supposed to get attention of the people you're speaking to or it, it, we, we didn't know what it meant until an Egyptian professor of um, language explained to me that this is identical to um, a term we use in Arabic today, in Egyptian Arabic, called da. And sometimes um, you would say things like um, da the weather is nice today. It's just, it, it, you can't translate it, but you're just marking a statement. Mm. Um, and when you translate the ancient Egyptian pool into the Arabic, yeah, it makes a lot more sense. And I was struggling a little bit with, with learning ancient Egyptian until we had to translate it into Arabic. And the grammar just made a lot more sense like that. And there are also so many different words, especially for people living outside of the big cities, where people are just using ancient Egyptian words all the time. Um, For example, a word that we never use in Cairo, but is used outside of Cairo is shin, shina. When you describe something as bad, you say it's shin for masculine, shina for feminine, and it comes from shin, bad in ancient Egyptian. Mm. And so many different words like that. Um, And, The ancient Egyptians also, when they wanted to um, emphasize a word, they would double it. So for example, I'll use a modern Egyptian. Oh no, I'll use an ancient Egyptian word. Gamgim means to to damage or or, um, bang very, very hard. And you say Gamgim, 
you're doubling the gam sound, which emphasizes just how loud and banging the sound is. Mm. And we still do the same with modern Egyptian. When you want to um, say something, you would double up. So um, you would say dab dib, which is a very similar word. Dab means to bang your foot down, you put your foot down. And so when you multiply, when you double the, the sounds, you emphasize the action. And this is something that we use still today using Arabic words, but using this ancient Egyptian grammatical construction. How interesting. You know, on a recent episode, we talked about Arabic spoken in Tunisia. And my guest was talking to me about this reduplication and how she's noticed it in North African Arabic speakers. And I wonder, maybe you know or don't know, but do you notice in this reduplication in other Arabic regions like Levantine Arabic or Gulf Arabic, or is this like something that's very North African? I'm thinking, I'm not sure. I have to pay attention to it from now on, but we know that there are ancient Egyptian words that have traveled through North Africa. Hmm. So we know there are words that were once written in hieroglyphs that have traveled through North Africa. So it could be that this ancient Egyptian tradition has gone through to North Africa, but I don't know about the other side. Okay. I'll have to, I'll, I'll keep my eyes out or my ears out for it and I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> now, speaking about Arabic as it's spoken in Cairo, um, what do you notice about the way the language is spoken in Cairo and how it differs or how it, it changes throughout other parts of Egypt or maybe in another city like Alexandria, for example? So Kyrians like to think that the world revolves around them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's, a, it's a dialect that's very different to all the other Arabic dialects. Um, and for example, one of the things we do is the G sound, the Z sound, so names like Jamal. Other Arabic speakers would say Jamal. Um, people in the south and in the north of Egypt, outside of uh, Cairo would say Jamal, but the Kairians say Gamel. Hmm. And that's our thing. And I, I remember someone recently said that they heard about, they heard a particular tribe somewhere else in the Arab world that pronounced the je as a G as well, but I can't remember the, the details, but it is a very Kairian thing, this G. Mm -hmm. And Everyone recognizes, every most Arab speakers would recognize, immediately recognize Egyptian, a Kairin Arabic, and immediately place it. Um, and they've, so other Arabic uh, countries have long listened to Egyptian or watched Egyptian cinema and Egyptian television, and they're incredibly familiar with the dialect. And it's very easy for me to be understood by all the other Arabic speakers, and most of them, um, will actually make the effort to change their accent and speak in Egyptian Kairin dialect. So I would be able to understand them without difficulty. Mm. And it's really, really sweet that people are so generous trying to um, make it easier for us to understand them because otherwise we, we may have some, some difficulties. Oh, that's interesting. Why do you think that, that the Egyptian dialect is so prevalent? Because of the cinema, the uh, pop culture, um, music, television, we've had a very early, very successful um, cinema industry and television industry in Egypt. And all these shows and movies aired everywhere across the Arab world. And so people are incredibly familiar with listening to this. And it was funny, I saw, I met a lovely a Tunisian woman a few weeks ago. And um, she was speaking to me and she was telling me, my God, you sound exactly like the movies. I've never met an Egyptian before. And I didn't really, it never occurred to me that this is actually how they speak. You sound like you're a character out of a movie. You don't sound real oh. um, because they're so incredibly used to seeing Egyptian films and, and listening to Egyptian music. I, I imagine, you know, this, this fake mid-Atlantic accent that is, was, all the rage in, in Hollywood in the golden era. Yes. And imagine if someone comes up and speaks to you like this. 
you, you're going to think that it's a bit odd. You're going to think it's slightly out of context. And I imagine this is how she felt. That's a really good comparison to make. I think about that a lot when I listen, when I watch old movies and I just like no one, I've never heard anyone speak like that. So it, yeah, it must be a big surprise to, to hear someone for the first time speaking, speaking this, (laughs) this um, Egyptian Arabic. Um, I want to talk about I want to talk about what you do. I want to talk about what you do because I'm so fascinated. Um, I would love to know about the connection of Egyptian cuisine and in antiquity to modern day fare. Like how, how do we know uh, what ancient Egyptians ate and, and tell us what's evolved and what's remained the same and, and where some of those connections are. So we have, we're very lucky. We have so many different forms of, evidence that we can use to study food throughout history. So we have excavations and you go out, you dig where someone used to live, for example, their houses, and you see where their ovens are. You get to see some of their tools, perhaps, that they they would have once used. We find a lot of ceramic vessels. So these pots are made out of clay that looking at the way they're shaped, you can figure out how they were used and how people were cooking. So for example, think of it, if you're going to fry something, you'll fry fry it in a shallow pan. But if you're going to bake something in the oven, you'll put it in a casserole. So as well in antiquity, if you wanted to cook a particularly shaped pot. And we can run chemical analysis on these clay vessels to be able to find out more about what people had stored or cooked in them. We also get a lot of plant remains and a lot of animal remains on archaeological sites, especially where people were living. So you're able to see, which is really, really cool, when you look at the animal bones, you can actually see where they've cut the bones. You see the butcher marks or the Mm. the cut marks on the bones. So you can figure out what kind of cuts of meat they had. And sometimes if they were spit roasting something, you would get... um, the, the fire remains on the bones, on the on the extremities and maybe on the on the on the jaw. So you can figure out that this was being spit roasted because it has the remains of where it was um, in close contact with the fire. And with the plants, you get to see a lot about the plants that they would have had um, accessible. And sometimes you can see little remains of how they prepared the plants. So for example, I have a particular type of beans. Um, that, the ancient, that the modern Egyptians love today. We eat it all the time, these broad fava beans. I have them from a site that's about a thousand, a thousand years old. Wow. And they're sprouting. So you can tell that people were sprouting these beans. This is not an ancient Egyptian site. This is a thousand years, about 900 years after ancient Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still very interesting that you're able to see how people prepared food like that. Um, and what other kinds of information? Oh, yes, because the ancient Egyptians believed that they would live again in the afterlife if they were good people, of course. So they wanted to make sure they had all their food with them in the afterlife. So those who could afford it would have really nice tombs and they would have a lot of offerings and tombs that they would be able to use in the afterlife. So the ancient Egyptians left um, bits of um, different cuts of meat or different types of ducks and geese and, and, um, and pigeons, for example, in the tombs. We have tomb scenes beautifully decorated that show us how the ancient Egyptians did things. So how they made beer, how they made wine, but it wasn't meant as a recipe to follow. They were just symbolic scenes that were meant to symbolically provide the beer and the wine that you would need in the afterlife. Mm. And we also have a lot of texts, just written texts, receipts, shopping lists. Um, this is true because sometimes you get one, a fa- one neighbor or family member would send a letter to someone else asking them for particular um, crop. So send me that much of wheat. You promised you would send me wheat last week, but you didn't. Or the wheat that you sent was infested with insects. So please send me new wheat. Mm. Um, So you get a lot of information from the texts, of course. And when you use all of this kinds of, of data together, you can form a picture. Although it's not always a perfect picture because we are interpreting a lot. We are using our 21st century imagination to interpret something so far away from us. But it's important that we know that our limitations, but we still have a lot of data to work with to imagine what people ate in the past. How, 
this is mind blowing to me. Um, <laughs> it, it really is because I think, you know, like I said before, I think Egypt and Egyptology and ancient Egypt and, and the history is such a part of this romantic lore that so many of us have, but I will be the first to say, I never even considered what people were eating and how they were eating it and what their methods were. So this really opens up my mind and makes me, you know, it, it paints a more vivid picture of what I imagine when I think about antiquity in Egypt. And it's amazing. Are there any words or techniques or any practices that have been you had been used during that time that are possibly still present in modern day Egypt or Egyptian cuisine? Certainly a lot of methods, traditional methods of bread production are, I, I would say, are probably identical or at least very, very similar. Um, in the south of Egypt, there's one particular type of bread called sun bread because you let it rise in the sun for a few hours before you bake it. And I'm quite confident, and a lot of specialists are quite confident that the ancient Egyptians would have made a very similar type of uh, bread. It's almost like a sourdough. Um, and I think a lot of methods of cheese preparation are identical, especially, so I think the traditional food people are eating outside of the cities is closer to what would have been available in ancient Egypt. Mm. Um, a simple basic diet, lots of food from the land, um, whatever's in season, and food that has been stored to prolong its shelf life, like dairy products being made into cheese or whatever to, to prolong their, their shelf lives. Um, I think this is this certainly continued. Are the are the names? Are there any relation to the names of the foods? Are the names of the um, the uh, the plants or the method the, of preparation? The, yeah, like the the plants, the crops that were being grown, and are there is there any relation to, with the 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 names of them? That's a very good question that I have to think about. Um, I know that some foods that we eat. We don't, they, they have a name, we don't know where the name comes from, which may very well have been, have been an ancient name, um, even if it's just a few hundred years old or a few thousand years old, I'm not sure. Um, that's a good question that I don't really know an answer to. Okay, that's fine. I was really just curious and I guess thinking about, um, you know, you mentioned fava and I remember one time I went to, <laughs> one time I did something is really not... <laughs> <laughs> worth telling this story but um, <laughs> I'm remembering the time I went to um, an Egyptian restaurant here in New York and I had the time of my life but I had this dish called fool and it's like yes. fava bean right yes this is it fool um, but I could be wrong because I haven't started learning Arabic yet I will it's in my few it's in my near future but in other places um, is it called fool is it, it has a different name in like different Arabic speaking countries, I thought. So I think that's where my mind was going. Just wondering if like that dish in, in Egyptian cuisine maybe came from, you know, an, an ancient name or an ancient like preparation at, um, you know, just talking about the word itself. So actually, now that you mentioned this, um, it is suggested that the word fool comes from the Coptic word fell. Mm. And the Coptic word fell may or may not come from an ancient Egyptian word per. But the letters P and F are very often interchanged. And ancient Egyptians didn't have an L. So the R sound, um, the L sound was represented by an R sound. Huh. Um, so fool could, could be an ancient, have an ancient um origin and i wonder but because fool in egypt a fool is always called fool regardless where it's being in across the arab world or okay. the arab speaking world, world okay but maybe you're referring to tamia and falafel hmm. because this is falafel i think everyone will recognize the word falafel mm -hmm. um in egypt falafel and tamia are the same thing they're the two different names falafel we call um, tamia falafel in the north and we call Falafel Tameya in the south and, and Yani. It's not very regional anymore. Falafel, Egyptian Falafel or Egyptian Tameya 
are made out of fava beans rather than the chickpeas that you get in other Arab countries. Oh. And I think in Sudan as well, they're also made with fava beans and they're made with a lot of fresh greens and herbs. So the inside of them is like an electric bright green, um, which is very different from the, the rich yellowish chickpea mm. color that you get in, in Falefo that you know from other parts of, of, of the world. Okay, maybe that's what I was thinking of then, yeah. Could be, but we're the only people who use the word tameya. But again, I I I have a feeling in Sudan they also refer to it as tameya. I'm not sure. Okay, about the the recipes that were being used in antiquity, um, and some of the the way the methods that are still in use today. But in essence, in the true form of the recipe that you know comes from the past, are they able to be replicated today? using the same techniques? Are you able to faithfully replicate, for example, a grandmother's recipe that she's left for you? That if it's just your grandmother is a couple of generations back and even a recipe so close to you, you will have difficulty replicating perfectly. Mm. And it might not even have the same, it might not taste the same, even if you faithfully redo it imagine what it would be like with recipes that are thousands or hundreds of years old Mm. we use a lot of experimental archaeology to figure out how the ancient egyptians um, prepared food so that means we try to look at all this data that i mentioned the the ovens the tomb scenes the tools the ceramics the animal remains and, and plant remains and try to figure out how they did things and try to replicate them as faithfully as possible but there's only so much that we can do because we we don't have any written down recipes from ancient Egypt, with the exception of one possible thing that we could possibly call a recipe. So we don't really know the proportions of things that they put together. And the raw ingredients themselves must have tasted very differently. Mm. The regular watermelon tasted very differently several hundred years ago. Um, and... Additionally, we don't know people's palates. Today, a lot of recipes say salt and, uh, salt and pepper to, to taste, but we don't know what to taste was for the ancient Egyptians. Yes. So we can't, we can't be certain, even when we have recipes from mid- the medieval period. So after ancient Egypt, um, 600, 700 years in a recipe book written in Egypt in Arabic. And we have the recipes of cups and, and tea. Um, so we don't know how this would have tasted like. We have absolutely no idea. Our products are different. We we just don't know. So one of the recipes, that's not an ancient Egyptian recipe, but one of the recipes I like to cook very often is um, 600-year-old uh, beef stew made with apples. Mm. And every single step of the way of recreating this recipe, I'm not sure if this is correct. How much do I cook the meat? Did they like it completely cooked through or did they like it slightly pink? Um, How do I marinate? How long do I marinate the meat for? Um, When I fry it, do I wait until it's completely golden or do I just leave it until it gets just a bit of color? All these questions, we just don't know Mm -hmm. how how they're done. Learn a language, make a friend, change a life. Did you know that you can learn Egyptian Arabic at Natakelam with one of their native tutors from displaced backgrounds? What's more, they also offer lessons in modern standard Arabic and in Iraqi, Sudanese, Yemeni and Syrian, Palestinian and Lebanese Levantine dialects. Sign up today to learn to speak like a native with Natakelam's tutors from displaced backgrounds. Speaking Tongues listeners get a special 10% off on all languages with the code SPEAKING10 at natakelam.com. Natakelam, learn a language, make a friend, change a life. That was actually, I'm glad you you mentioned that because that's the, the next question that I had for you was if we know how the palettes have changed and you know, clearly we we don't now, but um, are there any ingredients that maybe um, were used then that people wouldn't think of using as an ingredient now in their dishes? Um, before I get to that question, let me tell you something about maybe not necessarily a change in taste, but 
certainly a change in the choice. Mm. From one of the archaeological sites in Egypt, we have um, a space where people were living that is about 2,000 years old and a place where people were living that's about 600 years old in the same area. Okay. And they had access to the same foods. And you could tell that over time, their preferences changed from one foodstuff to another. And we know that this is not because of any economical uh, changes. We know that it's not because of environmental changes because these foods would have been available. But it was a matter of some kind of ch change. Is it a change in, the, in their palates? Is it a change of fashion? But we do sometimes observe that in archaeology. Mm -hmm. And then to get back to your question, you asked me about ingredients or some some uh, oh, crops yes. or something that were used in antiquity that people would maybe never think of using now. Um, so there's one fruit that was used by the ancient Egyptians. It's called mandrake. Yes, mm -hmm. you, 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 you know mandrake. And um, we don't know whether or not they ate them because it's not very pleasant to the modern palate. Mm. But we see a lot of scenes where people are holding mandrake and possibly about to eat them. So we often wonder maybe they just had a different palate then and they were able to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And today we just don't have the palate to, to enjoy this strong bitter taste of the mandrake. Um, this is one example that I can think of. But also there are many traditional crops that the ancient Egyptians would have eaten that are falling out of um, fashion. Okay. Um, so now the young generation think it's appalling. I never eat that. Take this away from me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. But this is how it is everywhere in the world. Yeah. So what what are some things that people are turning their turning their back on? Hobiza, purslane. It's a little bit like um, like a spinach. It's like a leafy green they use that you cook uh, all chopped up and. Like spinach, it can develop a slightly bitter taste when you cook it too long. Mm. And we do cook it too long and it's part of how we prepare it. Um, and so people don't like it anymore. And a lot of my generation may not even be familiar with it because it's it's fallen out of fashion. Okay. I said purslane. Hobiza is not purslane, it's mallow. Purslane is also a very similar green and um, regla, and it's also falling out of fashion. So these are two green things. Oh, out of I always like to ask these these questions because I'm really fascinated by like how our palates change and I know like I'm in the U.S. and one thing that like is not fashionable here is the bitter flavor like people prefer sweet or salty but bitter is almost non-existent but times I've been to Italy in you know specifically and and other parts of the world like bitter is everywhere and it's very much a desired, you know, palate. So I'm uh, a flavor, uh, very much a desired flavor. So I'm always curious about how, you know, our tastes change from country to country. But then, you know, as we're as we're going back and forth in time, just, you know, how things would have changed. <laughs> yes, and what I mean, the discussion of what is good to eat and what makes something edible is. Uh, long-standing discussion in the world of food history and food anthropology and how things how the edibility of things change through time and through regions it's it's a big thing mm -hmm. I always think a lot about bread and how bread is everywhere obviously but the bread technique and how bread has changed over time um how this is an aside because I'm just curious but how did they make bread and now, now that you asked me this, I remember that one of the types of Egyptian bread we make today um, has an ancient Egyptian word. Mm. Like it, it's, it has, its name comes from ancient Egyptian, but Teo bread probably comes from Patu. Um, and the P and the B are interchangeable. Yes. So how did the ancient Egyptians cook, uh, bake bread? We have many different um, types of evidence that show us different parts of bread baking. But one example I can tell you is um, from the Old Kingdom. This is the time period when they were building the pyramids. 
Um, so this is about 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Okay. I hate dates and I hate, I hate thinking and calculating. Um, yes, so this is AD, BC, we need to add 2,000 years. It, it becomes incredibly overwhelming sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so during the Old Kingdom, um, they were uh, making a type of um, bread. So you would grind your grains and they used emmer wheat, which is extinct today. This is one example of a food that has gone extinct. Mm. And they would grind the grains, mix it up with, with, um, water, uh, uh, with water. And then they would get these molds, uh, ceramic molds that look almost, almost like a cone-ish, almost not perfectly not quite conical, but almost like a cone. And they would heat these, these clay molds and then they would pour this very liquid batter into the heated clay molds and then put the clay molds onto the fire and they would stack them up maybe seven, eight, nine, ten 10 at the time. And they would bake the bread in that. And they would then have to break the mold to get the bread out. And it would have been a nice thick, um, uh, rich, form of bread and sometimes they would add um lots of additives to it like um a bit of spices maybe a bit of fennel some dried fruits to make sweeter cakes so mm. they would add dried figs or um raisins um and sometimes they would um we don't know if they really intentionally did that but sometimes you would find in the physical remains of bread that we get from archaeological sites you get bits of whole grains in them. So we don't know if, if it's just badly ground wheat or they actually intentionally added um, half broken grains that add more texture into their bread. Oh, okay. That's interesting that they would break the molds for, for so they must have been making a lot of these bread molds. They were making a lot of these bread molds. Wow. I, you know, I often wonder about that because maybe because we know this from experimental archaeology that when you have those you can't really get those um the bread out without breaking the mold mm -hmm. this is how we know that maybe they had a better idea and they just never broke them and they would just break during use and they just they would discard them so they didn't intentionally do that but based on archaeological evidence and experimental evidence we've figured that out okay <laughs> What do you think for you was uh, one of your more surprising discoveries? Maybe something you, yeah, maybe something you had a, a, a theory about at first, but then later, later on, you know. I can give you a very long list of theories and things I thought <laughs> that I realized were not correct. But fava beans, we do always think that fava beans have long been eaten by the ancient Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And you get scholarly publications that talk about how the ancient Egyptians ate these fava beans, the food that you mentioned. But when I looked at it in more detail, and I actually collected a lot of information about the physical remains of fava beans from archaeological sites, I realized that the ancient Egyptians probably didn't even have fava beans. Um, and certainly they weren't something that was eaten um, until about 2000 years ago. This is when it started being um, regularly eaten. Where would they have come from? I mean, were they always there and maybe weren't always being eaten or did they come from someplace else and introduced? Um, no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. Maybe they were there and we just learned how to cook them or how to cultivate them. Because also um, fava beans, like all pulses, have toxins in them and they need to be cooked to, in a particular way. And they need to, you know, you can remove their skins or their seed coats to make them more easily digestible. So maybe we just didn't know that you had to cook them so long. And mm. then someone came along and said, oh, why don't I just let them overnight? Maybe someone forgot them on the stove. Or not the stove, but the ancient Egyptian <laughs> equivalent of a stove. I wonder about that a lot. Like, I always, since I was a kid, I'd always ask myself, like, when I see something like a pineapple, like, who was the first person that realized this was edible? You know, because it's spiky or any type of fruit or vegetable or grain. Like, how did people figure out that this is what you're supposed to do with it? Like, how do they know 
who made that decision? So when you're saying like maybe someone soaked them a little bit too long or cooked them a little bit too long and that's how they figured out, like, is it that simple? I think accidents uh, play a very big role in why we do things the way we do. Although, of course, it's not always so simple. It's not always like that. But I think people have made more mistakes than we think. And many of these mistakes have resulted in a lot of really good food. Why do you think when we're looking at modern day Egyptian cuisine, um, just your own opinion, um, why do you feel like it's important to understand the past in terms of uh, botany, food, archaeobotany? Um, why do you think that it's important to understand this field when we are looking at modern day Egyptian cuisine? I think for me, it's a very personal quest um, because a lot of Egyptians don't think or don't believe that we have something called an Egyptian cuisine. Mm. Oh, we don't have any Egyptian food. What is Egyptian food? It is horrible. It is miserable. But Egyptian food, when you look at the history, there's just so much diversity. It is incredibly rich. And we do have a very long history of cuisine. And I, when I, one of the first questions I started asking myself when I first started working on food is I wanted to figure out how Egyptian cuisine became what it is today. And I don't have the answer to that, but I know that I shouldn't think of an Egyptian cuisine, but I should think of Egyptian cuisines mm. because there's so much regional diversity, temporal diversity, that it is not one single uniform cuisine that I can package as a whole unit and say, this is what Egyptian cuisine is. And it's also an incredibly, like all cuisines, it is incredibly personal. What I eat at home, it could probably be quite different from what my neighbor in the flat in front of me is eating, with the exception of molokheya and food, because we all eat that. But there's so much diversity and it's, and the authenticity is also another question that very often comes up into the discussion. What is authentically Egyptian? And I think it's important for me to explore this history and to explore just how dynamic food is. Um, food history is not like the monuments that are frozen in time that you cordon off and you call this an archeological site and you only go through it under particular conditions. But food is alive, it's about the people, it's about choices, it's about fashion, it's about always changing. And this is, this is very important for me to understand and to appreciate. And this really informs a lot of my work on food history. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, just thinking about how you said a about the the it's not one cuisine it's different cuisines and in different parts of the country um you know I'm thinking about the Nile River and how it flows through the whole country and you know particularly as we get closer to the Mediterranean and in the Delta region does cuisine change as you get closer to and further from the Nile River are we seeing maybe like more and even in, in ancient times, are we seeing more usage of the Nile to provide food for Egyptians? And then outwardly, we're seeing more reliance on crops and, and things that are sowed from the land? We don't like living away from the Nile. We okay. are all clustered, huddled together in like 3% of the, the, the entire land of Egypt because we just live on the Nile Valley, although over the last 20 years people have been expanding out into the desert. Um, but most Egyptians um, do live on the Nile Valley and the Nile does play a very important role in our lives in general. As you go up in the north, you get um, in recent, this is in recent history, more rice eating uh, cuisines, rice based cuisines. And on the Mediterranean and on the cities that are on the Suez Canal. So this little canal that connects between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, people eat a lot more seafood. And in the northern part of the country, closer to the Mediterranean, people eat a lot more seafood um, and nilotic fish as well. Okay. Um, as you travel southward, 
um, so halfway through the country, you start getting into a bread-based land where people are eating a lot more bread and not so much rice. Um, but this, I have to say, has changed drastically over the last few decades. So this is in the last couple of hundred years, I think, has had been the case. And over the last 20, 30 years, this has changed a lot because now people have people in the south have a lot more access to rice than they did before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this, this is one example of, of how the diet would have changed between the north and the south. Um, and we don't actually always have enough historical and archaeological information about different regions at the same time. So I might have one bit of information about this area 2,000 years ago, and then I'll have a bit of information um, about another area 1,500 years ago. So I can't really compare the different time periods. It it becomes a bit challenging. But like I mentioned, the example where people were living in the same area in the Roman period about 2,000 years ago and in the medieval period about 500, 600 years ago, there was a change over time, but I can't really talk about change geographically in the diet. That's so interesting. I always think of the Nile as this like all giving, all powerful river. Um, It is. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, that's at least what I learned in school that so many like ancient Egyptians really uh, relied on the Nile so heavily. So um, certainly in ancient Egypt, they probably ate a lot more Nilotic fish than mm-hmm. we do now. Okay. Or probably across the whole country rather than mostly in the north as they do now. Mm-hmm. I have to go to Egypt someday. Yes, you do. It's, yes, it's high on my list. And it's, you know, like I said, I, I realize that I have this romantic vision of Egypt and um, it's such a highly romantic, especially the city of Cairo. And, and I just, I want to see it. I want to see it someday before, before I'm too, before I'm too old to travel. <laughs> Do it. I mean, it's, it's changing like, like everything it's changing drastically it's no longer the Cairo I recognized from even two years ago Mm. but it's still and of course I am biased it is a very magical place whether Cairo or Egypt there's just so much there's just so much there's so much wealth there Mm. in culture in in nature I am I am biased (laughs) it's okay to be biased what do you think is something that someone going to Egypt or someone going to Cairo for the first time, what, what should we experience? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to say uh, a feluca on the Nile, just rent one of those little sailboats on the Nile. And it's wonderful over the right, right as the sun starts setting and then just have some snacks, some drinks on the Nile it's the weather just on being on the Nile is is magical and when it starts getting dark and the lights start shimmering all around you from the houses and the cars it is very magical and it's something that is just you get to experience the city when you also go up and down the Nile and if you look around Cairo just um, you get to see so much of the city so quickly without being stuck in traffic Mm. it's you you should not miss that and then of course there are the pyramids the museum um so much to see the old old islamic city there's there's just so much to do but these are things that everyone does anyway but yeah. don't miss out on the Kaluka. oh new life goal has been realized now <laughs> <laughs> and i think that you're probably the perfect person to ask when we get to egypt when we get to cairo what should we be eating what should you be eating so a lot of the really good food is home cooked that is very difficult to find. Um, But we also have a lot of street food that you can very easily get on the street. Um, Just make sure you acclimatize your stomach first before you go in um, full force eating the the street food. But of course, Egyptian falafel tameya is very, very special. Make them in these sandwiches full of a salad and tahina on it. It's just beautiful. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of kushari. No. 
Koshari. Oh my God, Koshari is, I think, one of the top three national Egyptian dishes, although it's only about a hundred something years old, but it is rice, um, small round pasta, vermicelli, which is the, you know, the, the vermicelli, the yes. really thin spaghetti, like, but short. Um, so rice, um, pasta, vermicelli, lentils, and this is the base of koshari, and you serve it with chickpeas on top and fried onions, like golden cr um, crispy fried onions. And you pour on top of this three things, a red, just a red tomato sauce, chili sauce, and then you mix all that up and you eat it. And it's just so much flavor and it's a carp fest. It is something that is very, it's something you cannot, you cannot miss. And very often when you're eating out in Egypt, you, especially if you're going to restaurants that serve meat, you can have Egyptian whiskey. So this is the dressing, the sauce that comes out of the salad. So basically it's just salad water. And we call it in Arabic sometimes salad water. Mm -hmm. And we call it also Egyptian whiskey because it's very potent. And it comes in little, almost like shot glasses. And you have a, a shot of that. And it's very, very, <laughs> it's a very special thing to do. Um, and it's um, highly recommended. I love the salad water. Ooh. And then molokheya, of course, you have to eat that. <laughs> We are really big on pigeons. We love pigeons, eat some pigeons. Um, some people eat the whole carcass with the bones and everything and chew them. I, I can't really do that, but mm -hmm. um, many people do that. So you should try to do it. Um, we like to eat brains. We like to eat marrow, um, bone marrow. We like to eat the hooves of the cow, which is just delicious. Mm. We eat all of that. Not always for the faint of heart, but you know you have to you have to try these things. You have to at least try. At least yeah. try. Yeah, and, and the nice thing is you can go when you go to the meat special meat vendors, they will lay out a whole bunch of all these things, so you can try everything. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I'm ready. <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> uh, tell us about eat like an Egyptian. Um, I love your content and I've, I've read all the articles that I could find on your website. Um, I'm so enamored with what you do for a living and oh, I, I, th I think it's amazing. Um, but please tell us about, about Eat Like an Egyptian and what you want people to take away from it. Um, how did you, how did you start this, um, aside from, you know, the, your, your work as a, as a doctor. Um, and most importantly, please tell us where we can find you and where we can read more of your work. Um, so a few years ago, I was, um, uh, I sometimes do historical dinners for people and I was uh, asked to host uh, or to prepare food for an ancient Egyptian inspired dinner for someone. And she kept saying, oh, you need a, a website. You need to create a website. You need to do this. I said, I don't have time for a website. I'm not doing a website. She said, you have to do an Instagram. I said, I don't have time for that. What am I going to do? She said, no, you have to. And she was so insistent that I thought, okay, I'll just create an Instagram account just to, to get her off my back. And I did. And I didn't even know what to call it. I thought, walk like an Egyptian, eat like an Egyptian, cheesy, but let's just get it out of the way. And <laughs> I created this Instagram account and I'd start once in a while to post something fun on it, but I started to really enjoy sharing content about Egyptian food history um, because I want people to know that there is so much history. Like I said, I want people to know that we do have an Egyptian cuisine and it does have a very long history. We have cuisines in plural and I wanted to share all of this information. And because my work is incredibly niche and such few people would ever actually read my publications. Um, but I wanted to make the information accessible in English and in Arabic to as wide an audience as possible. And so this is how it started. Sometimes it's more, it's easier and more fun to post. Other times it becomes a bit challenging. So I just go silent for a while. Um, but you can find me on Eat Like an Egyptian on Instagram. And I have their links to some of the articles I've written on Egyptian food history. Great. Thank you so much. And I will add the link to that in the show notes for this episode so that people who are listening can find you right away. Thank you.
at this uh, dinner that you were putting together, an ancient inspired dinner, what were some of the dishes that you had lined up for this this event? So, so I had this, I had many, many, many meetings with the chef who was executing this. And I kept saying, please make sure not to add any tomatoes or any peppers in, because these come from the Americas and weren't available in ancient Egypt. And guess what shows up on the trays after everything I've said and done? Tomatoes. Mm. And so that's all I could think of when I think of that menu, that someone messed it up by adding tomatoes. But I do remember there was herring, um, which ancient Egyptians certainly ate. Um, There was um, beef with lentils. Ancient Egyptians were big on lentils. And I can't remember the rest of the dishes because they were covered in tomatoes. Oh, gosh, (laughs) no. But I do have an app photograph of that on Instagram. So actually, if you scroll all the way down to my Instagram, um, you'll find you'll find the menu. I think I even have the menu there. Oh, exciting. Exciting. Dr. Eldori, thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you very much, El. I'm so I really hope that my questions weren't too stupid, but I'm really just. (laughs) No, no, it was wonderful to have a conversation with you. It was really nice because. Sometimes you get people that say, oh, wow, and they don't interact. But I really enjoyed speaking with you because you're interacting and it was fun. Thank you very much for your questions and your thought into preparing your questions. Oh, of course, of course. Um, I like to end each episode with the same question. And that is just a, a little fun question. Do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Egyptian Arabic to share? So I thought I'd share with you something that's very, very short that you can use and something that people actually use a lot in in Egypt. And it's made out of two words. That's it. Filmishmish. Fi means in. Mishmish are apricots. And you say filmishmish. Um, when you want to tell someone that something is never going to happen because the the season for apricots is so short that, you know, when I tell you, you know, filmishmish, I'll do this when, when it's apricot season and then suddenly the season's over. So I'm never going to do it. Filmishmish? Filmishmish, exactly. I love that. (laughs) Some people add bukra filmishmish. But I've never actually heard some foreigners add Bukra fil Mishmish, but I've actually never heard an Egyptian say Bukra fil Mishmish. Bukra means tomorrow. Oh, okay. But fil Mishmish is the, is the right uh, expression. Fil Mishmish. And I love that it's food related, like our yes. conversation. <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Mena. And uh, before I let you go, just one quick last question. Um, if we were in Cairo, and we just had this conversation and we spent this time talking and we're going our separate ways, what would be the best way to say goodbye? Salem or, or ma salema. Ma salema? So ma salema. Be, go in peace. Ma salema, mena. Yeah. And I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you, El, very much for having me. Bye. Bye.